Hey everyone, thank you for tuning in to our official first uh, Acquire and Retire podcast today. Um, my name is Haley Howard, if you don't know who I am. I am based out of Dallas, Texas. I am an agent. I own, uh, I'm a co-founder of Lush Property Solutions. I'm an, I'm an investor, wholesaler, and also an agent. And today I have the pleasure of being accompanied by not one, but two uh, real estate influencers uh, that have really influenced my life. Uh, one of them is my partner, uh, on this podcast, Bobby Sharma. Um, another one is Mitch Stevens. A little bit about Bobby Sharma is he is out of the Cali Bay area. He um, is an investor, syndicator, and also he has a real tech startup with called bettercapital.us. And our guest speaker today is Mitch Steven. Uh, some of you guys might know him as Mitch to be the bank Steven. Um, he is the true OG with owner financing and selling notes. He is uh, an author of not one, but three best-selling uh, books with his, uh, well, it's called His Life in a Thousand Houses. Basically, it's a three-book series. Um, he's been investing in real estate for over 25 years, not only in single family, but also in uh, storage units. And he's also a mentor to multiple students. He has created his own tech company, uh, not tech company, uh, mass messaging, uh, text messaging. And he is I'm just really grateful that he took the time out today to, you know, be here today and, and answer our questions. And thank you, Mitch, for, for being here. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here on the premiere podcast, no doubt. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, likewise, Mitch, I just want to add that, look, I, I read your book a long time ago, right? Way before. Uh, and it, it was really an inspiration for me to get into seller financing. So I'm very grateful I, I picked up a lot of in, uh, useful information. My only regret is why didn't I do more of those? So, but, uh, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is uh, truly, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I wish I had done more of those. But anyway, uh, you know, uh, tell us a little bit about your personal path to your financial freedom. What were your, some of the challenges that you encountered along the way? But tell us how it got started. Well, I have a list of business cards about a, a six inches tall of things that didn't work out. I was trying real estate. Uh, I had, you know, bought into the buy and hold. Uh, found out that my bottom line on buy and hold wasn't what it looked like on paper because the expenses and the move outs and the, and the jerks, quite frankly, were hard to mitigate. So um, I started to get out of that business. And then I hired a mentor who showed me how to keep all my houses, but move from a landlord to be in the bank and clear the same amount of money and have no liabilities for air conditioners and roofs and hot water heaters and be able to take substantial down payments and still keep the cash flow. So uh, I went from trying to, you know, I had $7,500 a month supposed to come in positive cash flow on my rentals, but not even I was naive enough to think that I would collect it all or that I wouldn't have to spend any of it. I was just trying to get $3,500 a month to come in so I could quit my job. And when I was a landlord, I wasn't clearing any. Hey, hey guys, I had a problem. Yeah, I when I went to go live, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't stream. Uh, uh, that's bizarre. Did we, Mitch, you still there? Oh, we lost Mitch. Uh, that's bizarre. Uh, why did we lose Mitch? <laughs> I'll I'll, uh, I'll make sure that. Uh, it's going to ask me a couple of questions, so I want to make sure I answer them. A 
Okay, three, two, one. We're live. Hey everyone, thank you for tuning in today for our official first release of Acquire and Retire with Real Estate Investing. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Haley Howard. I'm based out of Dallas, Texas. Uh, I'm what you would say a serial entrepreneur. I am a uh, investor, wholesaler, agent, and a multifamily syndicator. Um, today, I have the pleasure of being accompanied by not only one, but two of, uh, you know, of my real estate, of real estate influencers in my life personally, and I'm sure multiple others. Um, one is Bobby Sharma. He is my podcast partner. He is a syndicator. He is a investor out of the Cali Bay area. Um, he also has a tech startup with a uh, real tech better capital us and our guest speaker today is mitch steven some of you guys might know him as mitch be the bank steven uh, he has been investing in real estate for over 25 years not only single family but also with storage units uh, he is a mentor to a lot of mentees he is the true og of owner financing and selling notes he has written not one but three uh, best-selling books uh, about his journey in a thousand and houses. Um, he is also create. He also created his own software, texting software. Um, so we are incredibly grateful for him taking the time out today to to be here and to basically tell us about, you know, what got him started and and his his journey. Hello, Haley. Hello, Bobby. How are you doing? I'm happy to be hey, here. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you for taking the time to, uh, out of your busy schedule to be with us and. Uh, we're truly honored to have you on our premier uh, inaugural podcast with you. So uh, thank you for-, for Oh, for I got the premiere, that's great. So I just <laughs> yeah. wanna tell everyone, I was at my ranch, I'm out in the middle of nowhere, and they had some problems with the internet there. So I had to move to a, a top of a hill so I can get, so if you see my, I'm doing this in my truck, but you know, uh, true entrepreneurs, we just get it done one way or the other, right? So we're getting it done. Whatever God it takes. Bless technology. <laughs> <laughs> whatever it takes, whatever. Uh, look, uh, a lot of people obviously know you, but let just to all, all the newcomers, all the new people that we're reaching out to, tell us a little bit about you. How did you achieve financial freedom, and and maybe what were some of the challenges that you ran across in the in the early days? Well, I have a stack of business cards about six inches tall that didn't work out. Um, I'm in real estate because it was the last thing left. And, you know, if this didn't work, I was just going to go jump off a cliff or something. Not really. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I stumbled into real estate by accident. I bought a condo that I wanted to live in. And then it was too small. And I got a bigger one. And I rented out the other one. And then I rented out the room in my big condo. And pretty soon I was living for free. Not only living for free, but I was making some money. I bought into the landlord idea. And I got about 25 houses. I was supposed to clear about $300 a house on paper between what I owed and what I collected, but it ended up being about zero. I was supposed to collect about 7,500 a month, but not even I was naive enough to think I was going to keep it all. I knew something would break. I knew there would be move outs. I knew there would be things. I was just trying to make 3,500 a month so I could quit my job. And so out of the 7,500, I was hoping to clear 3,500. When I cleared zero after about 18 months of having these 25 houses, I got in a panic and I hired a coach and he taught me how to owner finance my houses. I picked up about $3,000 a house. I had 25 houses. These were down payments, not deposits. So I had 75,000 in the bank, more money than I'd ever seen in my life nor ever dreamed of. And that 7,500 I was supposed to be making on paper that I was only counting on 3,500 from, or was just trying to make 35 out of the 700 stick, I started collecting the whole 7,500 a month. So I went from a, a don't wanter to, a, to desperation, to hiring a coach who changed my world in about, uh, really in about two weeks, I got the concept. I did my first house, I got it. I, went, I spent about four months converting all my houses to owner finance, and I went from I don't know, desperation to elation in a, in a short period of time. And I've been in that business now for about 25 years. And it's been a, quite a journey. Man. Very nice. Just, just, just so you know, it, it even freaks me out. But I don't, 
you know, I don't say these things. I know there's a bigger gun down the street. I know there's a faster gun down the street. I know probably within, you know, if I'm walking in town within 50 feet of me on any given day, there could be multiple people that could use my financials to wipe their back end with. I understand that. But where I'm at right now, there's a lot of people that like to be where I'm at. So I'm, I'm reaching down to help those people up, but I also have mentors in my life where I'm reaching up and, and asking for help from them. But in my career, I have purchased a house about every four to five days for two and a half decades, about a hundred houses a year. And I'm, I'm, I'm well over 2000 houses now. So it's wow. been a steady, tumultuous, um, big time learning every day, still learning every day. Uh, journey. Wow. Very nice. That's impressive. Very, Life yeah. goals. <laughs> so uh, that being said, uh, what is the best advice that you've received that's really like changed the game for you? That's opened your eyes. That's, you know. Just... Well, there's been, there's been many, you know, you can imagine at different levels, there's revelations of different sizes and they get you to where you're going. Um, one of my biggest regrets is that I didn't hire uh, someone who was who I wanted to be, where I wanted to be, and was doing what I wanted to do earlier on. I could have saved myself many, many heartaches, and and I, quite frankly, should have been where I'm at faster. But I ran into a lot of roadblocks that I wasn't expecting. Yeah, I should. And and Mitch, can you uh, maybe dive into that a little bit? What were the roadblocks on the? acquisition side or was it the legal paperwork or was it the qualification it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't the acquisition side because back when i started you could get in the classifieds in san antonio texas a town of a million seven hundred thousand people and if you started at eight you could find a perfectly good house by noon any day of the week if, and if you screwed up you'd find two and you wouldn't know uh, how you're going to find the money for both of them uh, i started out buying my houses on credit cards because houses wow. back then in San Antonio were 15,000, 20,000, and you could rehab a 1,300 square foot house for 10,000 bucks. So I caught onto that very quickly. I, back in the day, it's not the same anymore, but you could, if you had good credit, you could apply for a card and you automatically got it. And you had the, all their major cash limits and everything available to you. So I went and got 45 credit cards and I walked around town and saying, I want 10,000 off this card and 10,000 off this card and I'm gonna buy the house. And then I want 10,000 off this card and I'm gonna fix the house. And then within 60, 90 days, I'd flip the house, uh, sell it. Well, I, I, actually, I would sell or finance it and then sell the note in the same transaction. And uh, I did that 450 times in a row with credit cards until someone from a bank said, will you come sit down with me and let me help you? And then they opened up some other doors to me but the biggest problems was the legal problems. And that's why I wrote my first book was the gurus out there were telling me and showing me big checks and fancy cars and airplanes and boats. And they were telling me all this pretty and great stuff, which can be true, but they were telling me none of the downsides. So my book, my life in a thousand houses failing forward to financial freedom. I wrote that book to, to tell everyone, what happens after the get rich seminar? This is how it really works. This is what you're really going to run into. This is what you better be prepared for because they're not talking about it because they can't sell a course if they tell you exactly how difficult it is or, 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 or they're not going to sell as many courses as easy. Right. And, and so I'm here to tell you what my life was like for better or for worse in that journey of how I went from doing zero houses to doing a hundred houses a month. I think one month I did 150, I mean, not, a hundred houses a year. I'm sorry. One year I did a, on my third year, I did 150 houses. That was too much for me because I quickly learned I could outrun my systems. I could outrun my ability as a one man show or a four man show. There was, this, there was a lot of money coming in the front door, but it was all being robbed or stolen or missed going out the back door. And Ron Legrand said to me one day, in a seminar in front of 300 people called me a dumbass and said, why don't you do half as many houses and make as more money and have a life? And I went home to my hotel that night. And even though I didn't like it, I, uh, I agreed with him. Wow. And I began and, to uh, change yeah. again. Sure, 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 sure. Uh, 
Excellent. Uh, uh, Haley? Uh... So, um, so uh, basically, I know you have several different websites to, that's, and businesses that support real estate investors. Um, is there a reason that you created, you know, like homestogo.net, cashforhouses.net, uh, loans to go, stuff like that? Uh, it, well, was it pertaining to, you know, your business or, you know? One of the hardest things an entrepreneurial, an entrepreneur will ever do is have one great idea and finish big. Entrepreneurs see opportunity in a lot of things. My biggest mistakes early on was I would spread myself too thin and try to do too many things. I quickly learned that I needed to pick one strategy and just become the master of all masters at it. And I picked, you know, to buy houses with OPM or other people's money and to sell them with seller financing. And the reason why I liked that strategy was because I could get some money for a down payment, $10,000, which I needed to live on and pay my bills, but I could create a three or $400 positive cash flow coming in the back, coming in the back door every month for 30 years that I was not a landlord. I wasn't responsible for the roof or the hot water heater. So I backed up, I shunned everything and I became an expert at that. But as time went on, there were, there were things that were running out of my exhaust pipe that were valuable, but I wasn't capitalizing on it. Mm -hmm. Let me paint you this picture. Let's say you own a lumber yard and your mm -hmm. job is to make trees into boards. So what happens when you do that? You get mountains of sawdust and you have now the expense of removing it or you can find a way to sell that sawdust. And yeah. so my, my businesses are all peripherals. Um, <clears throat> Homes to go is just a selling site because mm -hmm. selling is completely separate from buying. My advice is never have your buying site and your selling site the same because they're two different people with two different motives in a whole two different languages a whole two different sciences, how you talk to a buyer and what you talk about and how, what you're talking about with a seller is all completely different. And then loans to go, I got so much private money at one time that I couldn't get it all out. And just because the money's available doesn't mean you go out and you start making crappy loans and crappy deals. Mm -hmm. So I kept my underwriting the same. And then I kept losing these people though because I couldn't get their money out fast enough because there was too many people that wanted to give me money, too much money. So I started a hard money loan company, loans to go.net to, to, to loan money on six month periods, you know, six months at a time to keep my private lender's money occupied until I could get to it. You okay. see, when I sell or finance houses, I need long-term money underneath. So it's not like a flip where I need $100,000 and in 60 days, I'm going to flip the house and I get the money back. Yeah. When I borrow, when I borrow 100,000, when I sell my houses on owner financing, I have that 100,000 out for five years, 10 years, 15 years. So every time I buy a house, I got to go out and I got to find another person. You know what I mean? So yeah. right now houses are expensive, you know, or way more expensive than they used to be. A million dollars used to get me 20 houses, maybe 25. Today, a million dollars gets me, uh, 10 houses, maybe, you know what maybe. I mean? Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so all my businesses, but I've been, and then I would hire a partner who was an expert at that business so that I was bringing in the sawdust, but they were, they were professionals at, at making the, that sawdust into boards and they yeah. would offer, they would open up that company and they would run it using my residual. So we would be a team. Yep. Yeah. I love that. Love that. Uh, what about, uh, can you touch a little bit about the uh, forever cash storage business that you have? Yeah, so flipping houses is a one-time cash event. And I'm quoting Jack Bosch from the book Forever Cash. He's a friend of mine, and I always like to give him credit because he did kind of open my eyes. Uh, so that's a one-time cash event. You fix a house, you sell it, it's over. Notes are temporary cash event. I get some down payment up front. That's immediate. And then I have this cash flow, but these notes are going to expire. The average mortgage in America lasts about seven and a half years, even if it's a 30 year note, because it gets paid off for one reason or another. Usually it happens when they go to move to get a bigger house or, 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 or take a different job somewhere else and they list the house with a realtor and it sells. And then I get a call for a payoff. Uh, in my industry, maybe in the economic zone that I deal in, maybe the notes last 10 to 12 years because my people are a lot less likely to be refinanceable you know, but they still sell houses. And so that's a temporary cash event. So I learned early on that if I wanted to 
buy my freedom, I would have to take the money that I made from one-time cash events like flipping or wholesaling and temporary cash events like seller financing. And I would have to take all that money that I made and I had to buy something that was gonna be forever mine. And I picked mini storages because I rent those storages and that business, that storage facility is mine until I decide I don't want that income anymore. And so that's why I picked storages. I picked storages because they don't deal with people's livelihood. You know, when I foreclose on a storage, nobody has to go live under a bridge on my account. Yeah. You know, it's a lot easier to foreclose on junk than it is to kick someone out of a house. True. Do you do like a, just, just curious, uh, do you do like storage wars or anything like that? Or that's not your cup of tea? <laughs> As we know, in a lot of reality TV, our, <laughs> our industry included, it's all canned. It's nothing like they say. And, and, you know, when I go to auction a unit, there's nothing in there of value. That, <laughs> it's certainly not worth my time to find that, to hope. It's a form of gambling. These yeah. people have, they've turned gambling into a sport. <laughs> yeah, to uh -huh. a sport. Other, it's not like going to Vegas. They're going to gamble on what's in that box yeah. that they can't open. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's a mystery it's box. Very, <laughs> yeah. But, look, but, like any, but like anything else, if that's yeah. what you want to become an expert is, is, is flipping storage units, then you can win at that game. But you got to go all the way in and you got to know, you got to, you know, get it down to its finest points and know all the minutiae. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, it, yeah, it is a sport and it is nothing like what's on TV. So yeah. <laughs> TV is for entertainment only. Uh, but yeah, no, for, ser it's for serious investors, you, you know, stick with, stick with just, you know, uh, running a, a good business. Uh, so now, I, uh, I know those, I know those houses in my town that they, that they say that on the TV shows that they, 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 I saw them get, they didn't sell those houses. They got foreclosed on. I, I know what happened to those houses. It was all fabricated. As a matter of fact, A and E followed me around for three weeks and wanted was asking me to do one of those shows. The, one of the first questions they asked is, "Can you go in and out of a house in six weeks?" In six weeks, I said, "You know, if I found a house right now that didn't need one drop of paint, and 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 I was going to sell it to a new new loan person right now, it would take longer than six weeks to get the loan." Yeah, just yeah. doesn't happen. Yeah. And they yeah. said, and they said, well, we'll fix it. We can fix yeah. it. I said, well, I don't even know if I want to do it now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. um, Mitch, now that the prices, in, especially around in your market, right, where you're, it's one of the hottest markets in the country, the prices have gone up. There's no more, you know, a fifteen, twenty, twenty-five thousand dollar homes. So how are you adjusting your strategy? for these you know, homes that are now 120, 125, what, what's working in, with those, in those bigger numbers? Well, for one is I learned early on, the very cheap houses had a lot of moving parts. They, they, would come in, they would come in and they would go out because the people at the very bottom of the economic um, echelons, they can't take a bump in the road, you know? Uh, one bump in the road and they're behind and they can never catch up. Uh, so I started even before houses got more expensive. I moved up into more expensive houses where I could find more stability. And so that, you know, if someone lost their job and they were, they were out for three months, they probably had savings and other means and, and ways to, to keep their payments current. I don't like foreclosing on people. When I make a deal with someone, my, my motive is not to, wait till they falter and kick them out and take their house and keep their down payment. I don't like that plan at all. I don't think it's a Christian plan. I, when I make this deal, I want it to stick for the whole term. I want their grandchildren to inherit that house. Yeah. Uh, you know, if I have to foreclose, I do, but I work very hard to qualify people to make sure that the people I'm putting in are going to make it. Yeah. And I take all that time that, that I would spend foreclosing on houses or evicting people I spend that time just finding another house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I believe in karma, Bobby. You believe in karma, Absolutely. like what goes around. I believe if I have bad intentions in my business, then, then bad things are going to eventually happen to me. Uh, if I have a good intentions in my business, then good things will happen to me. And that's been a lifelong philosophy.
Yeah. I agree. Uh, and you know, uh, Mitch, look, I, I was fortunate enough uh, to have read your book. Uh, it's been about, it's been at least five years since I read it. And because of that, I got motivated. I went and acquired some, they were in the uh, Missouri and, and Ohio markets, but, uh, but I do own some seller finance properties there. But uh, what are your students now? First of all, what makes a good student? Uh, what, what are some of the characteristics of the, 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 you know, you may get 10 students, but only maybe two or three succeed at this. What, what is it about those two or three that, that makes them succeed in your system? Well, you're right. It's not like everything else. There's the 80-20 rule. Maybe in real estate, it's the 90-10 rule. I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm not a mill house. So, you know, if you want to order my courses online, I don't gate anybody about that. And I don't, you know, it's not that big amount of money. And if someone wants to try something on for size, I think that's fair enough. Go ahead. You know, the middle echelon is like 3,500 bucks. It's a weekly call. And, and if you listen to me for for even 10 phone calls out of the year, every, every Tuesday we have this call. Um, I don't know how I don't save you or help you from losing 3,500 bucks. On the upper echelon, which is much more expensive, like 25 grand, I actually have interviews with people, and this is where I'll get to your answer your question. I mm -hmm. interview the people for about an hour because I want to make sure that I can help them. I will maybe only take 12 people this year at that level. I'm not a mill house. When you, when, when I'm talking to them, I'm talking to them, you know, I, they're talking to me. I'm not subbing them out to a, to an underling or a, a person who's done 20 houses. They're talking to a guy that's done over 2000 houses that worked and maybe 10,000 houses that didn't work, you know, or, or deals that didn't go through. So um, what I'm looking for is people that already have a game at that level. And I'm just, mm -hmm. can I improve their game? I listen to their game. You have 50 doors, you have 25 doors, you have 100 doors. Tell me what you're doing. And then when I start to see things that I would do differently because they're missing a lot of money, then that's when I'll take them as a coach. Say, look, I already know I can get you your value back. I can see from what you're telling me. I can see a lot of places that we can pick up this money, that you can recapture that money that you're paying me. If I don't see that, I won't take them. But the number one thing I'm looking for is they have to be doers. Mm -hmm. They have to be coachable and they have to be doers. And uh, because I can teach you everything in the world, but if you don't get up off the sofa, it ain't, it just doesn't work. It's not going to work. Yeah. Make, make no, I, I agree. Cause you can, you can teach a trade, but you can't teach ambition. And I, I yeah. truly believe in that. Yeah. So, but I think how I separate myself from a lot of people is just, if I don't think I can help you, I'll move you down to a different level or, or, or you know, cause I'm not going to take that amount of money from someone to see if this game's a fit for them. That's too much for someone to lose, especially when they're new. And a lot, most of the people I, that I talk to, you know, they're not wealthy. You know, they're trying to get wealthy. So um, I think that's the key though, is um, to, to only invite people once, once you've had a chance to talk to them and see if you can really help them. Right, right. Makes a lot of sense. So, uh, bitch, you mentioned that you have a, you have a mentor. Um, would you mind, uh, I guess, ex who is well, he, the, you know, has he, how do you influence your life? Uh, and just a little bit more about yeah. that. Well, I was going broke with these 25 houses. I knew a guy who was about 38 years old at the time, you know, 20 years ago, and he had 500 houses free and clear. And I told him I was having problems and I needed help. And he told me, he interviewed me and looked around and says, I know exactly how to fix your problem. He said, it ain't going to take very long. He says, what I'm going to have to tell you is not going to take very long. If you'll do what I tell you, it'll solve the problem. But don't think that, you know, he asked me for $10,000 at the time, 20 years ago. $10,000 is a decent amount of money even yeah. today. But, yeah. but, but when, when 20 years ago, and when it's your last $10,000, which was the case with me, it was the last $10,000 I had. It was a monumental decision, but I said, how do you think you'll fix it? And he said, that, that $7,500 that you have on paper that's supposed to come in, I can make it come in and I can pay you. You can get paid to make it come in. And I said, how long will it take? He says, well, 
it won't take long to do the first one. It might take a little while to do all 25 of them. And I said, but I'll get my 7,500 every month. I said, yeah. So I, I did a little quick math. I'm not really good at math, but I'm getting better. I needed $10,000 to give him so he could make me 7,500 a month. I don't know what that percentage is, but I know it's good enough to get in. It's a pretty good percentage. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what that ROI is, but I'm in. <laughs> Okay, so what, what, what was the key, uh, you know, three things that he coached you on to, well, to tweak your model a little bit? He showed me how to pick up cash flow without having to be liable for everything in the world from the front mailbox to the back fence that breaks, you know, and that the people that were going to move into these houses as the owners after giving me a 10% down payment were going to be a whole different person. It was their house. They were going to, instead of tearing houses down and moving out, they were going to fix houses up and stay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Makes so bas noise. basically like building, building your equity up <laughs> in the house. Well, um, they were building the equity up in my collateral. So yeah. that collateral. if they ever yes. did walk, I, yeah. I, I, when I, when I, if I had to foreclose or repossess the house, I had a much better house than I had when I let, when I gave it to them. Right. Which, right. Which hardly ever happens in a rent house. Right. Right. So, Mitch, how are you dealing with the COVID, uh, you know, from your business model, right? Uh, the way I look at it, you're minimally impacted because you're not, they're not, they're not tenants, they're owners. Um, but uh, but th th is there a time between when they're still considered tenants to the time they become, they go on title or, but, but mainly I want to know, has COVID and all the regulations, the moratoriums, have they impacted your business? The, the buy with other people's money and sell with seller financing is a very resilient model. It actually booms in the hard times because in the hard times, people can't get loans to buy houses and my market explodes. Mm -hmm. Like right now, COVID, before COVID, let's say there was 70% of the people in the world could qualify for a loan. After COVID, there's 30% less of those people can qualify for a real loan. Mm -hmm. So those 30% just fell into my marketplace. I'm right. averaging four days on the market and 12% down. Oof. And my, wow. my, my P, P I T I payment is pretty much equal to whatever the rent is across the street. It, and so, and these people put 10 and 12 and 15,000 down and they've also done improvements before COVID hit. They had added porches, paved driveways, painted houses, put in land. They're well invested emotionally and financially in these houses. And if they ever do walk, I'll inherit a much better house and be able to sell it for way more than I, than I sold it to them for. But, um, but uh, that's the big thing is that uh, they have a different mindset. I see. And, and they have a different level of investment. When you go to rent a house, you get the first month's rent plus a deposit equal to the first. Maybe that's $3,000, right? Mm -hmm. When was the last time you got a fifteen or twenty or or $30,000 deposit non-refundable on a rent house? Never. Yeah. But I, from time to time, do collect $20,000 down on a $100,000 house. It's a possibility because people who sell their houses or come from Mexico or whatever, they want to take their cash and put it into the house so it doesn't evaporate. And so I may only be asking 10% down. That doesn't mean that's all I get sometimes. Sometimes people give me 30,000 down on a, on a $100,000 house. And these are good days. They're not regular days, but they're good days. And they happen a fair amount of times throughout the year. Yeah. There's a huge difference between buy and hold and seller financing. Yeah. So during COVID, I did have some people call me. I said, I'm, I'm not forgiving any payments. I will take two or three months and put them to the back end to try to help you. And this is after I looked at their pay history. If they had been good payers, if they had been honest, if they had, if they were workers, I looked at how much they gave me. If they give me an extraordinarily high amount of money, I would certainly work with them because I wasn't after their, their money. But once they learned that I wasn't going to give anything away, they decided they'd just make their payments. Mm -hmm. yep. It makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, well, um, so I know you've written three books. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about each book and why you chose to, uh, to write them? 
Okay, the very I never chose I never I never wanted to be an author. It was never on my plate. Somewhere there's at least four English teachers rolling over in their grave. I have a high school education. Um, something tragic happened to me, and I didn't realize what I was doing. But I was I wrote twelve. I, I was journaling in my grief. I later found out that it's a natural phenomenon to want to catalog your life when tragedy happens. Why am I here? What have I what have I done while I'm here? What am I going to do? Why did this happen? How, what do I, what do I do after this happens? You know, how am I going to live? How do I live with this? Mm -hmm. I wrote 1200 pages and I was buying so many houses and the house, the house business was such a big, huge part of my life that I, that when I talked about my life, it was smothered in houses in daily events. <laughs> and it got into the hands of someone who was a professional book writer and they told me, it was one of my private lenders, ask if he could read my journal because he was trying to help me deal with my grief. And when he finished reading it, he says, you have to make this a book. He showed me how to make it into a book. We edited it down. And the rest is kind of history. I, I self-published. I didn't ask anyone for permission. Um, I started doing blogs and podcasts to just tell people that I had a book. So I and then people started reading it. And then my life went in a direction I never planned or never wanted, never thought to do. People were seeking advice. The first thing they wanted to know was how many, how do you buy so many houses? So then I wrote the second book on purpose, my life in a thousand houses, how to, uh, 200 plus ways to buy houses. And then everyone kept asking me, how do you own or finance all these houses? Where do you, where do you, how do you make it work all the money that you need and, and how does it work? And so then I wrote the third book, My Life in a Thousand Houses, The Art of Owner Financing, which took me to stages, to all over the country, to even out of the country. Uh, I met people I never would have met. And it's just funny how God and the world works. You know, I was giving, one thing they liked about my first book was, it was so raw because I was so deep in grief, I did not care. I didn't give a crap about what, it, what I looked like or or what the world would think of me. I was falling down all the time. I was getting burned all the time. I was making big mistakes, but I kept getting up and I did make it. And so when I told the story, I had a lot of people ask me, are you sure you want to put this book out because you're not looking very smart? And I said, well, this is I, what, it's what really happened. I, you know, I, I, it's the truth of what happened to me every single time. And even then they asked me like, are you sure your wife's okay with this? You know, because my wife and I would have big fights over, you know, she once discovered that I had $250,000 worth of credit card bills that I was hiding from her and I almost had to get divorced. Uh, but, but, you know, I was trying to explain to her that I had $500,000 worth of houses free and clear, but she's not at that level. It took me years to get to that level to be able to understand why I was doing it. And for her to try to absorb it, that's why I didn't even ask her in the first place because I knew she'd say no because she couldn't have the understanding that I had. I'd been years uh, studying this business mm -hmm. and, and I knew what I could do and I knew what those houses were worth. Mm -hmm. So um, that's one of the things that people liked is like, I didn't care. When they asked my, I went and asked my wife, is it okay? And she read the chapters about our disputes and our fighting and, and our disagreements and she says, well, it's not very pretty, but it's the truth of what happened. So if it's the truth, it should stand. Yep. I love that. It makes, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, Mitch, what, what advice would you give to somebody that's getting into real estate now, you know, during this pandemic? Uh, you know, a lot of people six months ago, four months ago, five months ago, were thinking there's going to be a lot of uh, real estate going on sale. Uh, you know, but just the opposite has happened in, in the real estate, in the residential market, of course, in the commercial office space and some of the other retail space, there's a little bit of a bigger shock to the system. But what, what would you tell somebody who's, you know, just relatively new and getting started into the real estate game? Learn a lot from the internet, find out what strategy fits you your personality and your, and your market, figure out what turns you on, what you think. 
And then once you figure that out, stop looking at everything else and start drilling down just specifically on that strategy. And then when you're sure that strategy is for you, then go get a coach that is A, d doing it right now, B, has done it to the level that you want to do it, or someone you aspire to reach that level. And then last but not least, and, and, and this is very important, make sure the person that you pick is the kind of person you want to be on and off the field because you can't separate someone's true personality from the business. At some point, they collide. And, and do your research. Ask about those mentors before you write those checks and make sure that you're going to get what you think you're going to get. You know, if, you know, if I go to Kiyosaki, and I, you know, I like Kiyosaki. He's a smart guy. I never met him. But if I go to sign up for his course because I listen to him speak, the problem is, is I'm never going to talk to him. I'm going to talk to someone else. Now, if that's okay with you, then go ahead. But if that, if you want to talk to, if you want the mentor to be the guy that's doing the business, then you need to maybe come to a local area where you can find someone who's doing it in your area. And it also really helps if the mentor that you're talking to, if his strategy will work in your market. Mm -hmm. Because yes. my, my strategy doesn't work in a lot of markets. California, sure. uh, uh, Hawaii, um, you know, New York, there's places where it's too hard to foreclose on people. There's places where houses are too expensive and seller financing doesn't make as much sense. You can still do it. You just need to know the differences and what the odds are. Right. So uh, that being said, what would you say to experienced investors? Like as far as uh, taking it to the next level? There's a lot of masterminds out there. And that, you know, when I wanted to learn how to automate my business and, and try to back out of my business and still keep it running. You know, I went to a mastermind that cost $30,000 if it cost me a dime. It wasn't 30,000 up front, but by the time I paid the hotel bills and the airline tickets and the time away from work and the, and the, and you know, when you're eating with multimillionaires, they don't go to McDonald's, you know, <laughs> they're, you're spending three, $400 a meal with these guys. And, and, but, they, they showed me how to automate my business and, and, and not, and I didn't take any one person's advice. I watched how the guy over on the left did it, the guy in the middle, how he did it, the guy on the right. And I started to formulate how I was going to do it. And I got to talk to those people whenever I wanted to, because I, I was part of that mastermind. I haven't seen the last 450 houses I bought. I have not seen the last 450 people that bought my houses, which is why I can do this. Love Thanks. that. There's always another level, no matter where you're at. Right, right. Um, um, so, ahead, what, so, so speaking of, uh, so now you said that that's why you're doing podcasts. So what made you want to create your podcast a few years back? Well, let's, uh, I'll be real transparent, real transparent. So you got this guy right here, he's full mm -hmm. of energy, got more money than he needs. And now you give him 24 hours a day with nothing to do. What do you think <laughs> happens to a man when he has money and nothing to do? What do you think he goes out and does? He talks you to think people. <laughs> he probably goes out and gets in trouble, right? So I figured I better go back and go, go to work. And so since I didn't really need more money, although money's how we measure and money's the name of the game, and of course we'd all like to double our net worth and all that, but it needed to have a higher reason mm -hmm. than just – the money anymore because if i made an extra million dollars in the next 10 minutes it's not going to change anything it's not going to change what i eat it's not going to change what i drive it's not going to change where i live it's not going to change my friends it's not going to change anything right so you know dale ramsey does the primal scream when people get debt free it, 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 in my coaching class on the on the on the lower and the middle level we ring the bell when people fire their boss that's the goal of is to help people get independent so that they can take 2,600 hours a year and instead of giving it to a J-O-B, they can give it to themselves mm -hmm. so they can find out where they belong in this world and become all they're supposed to be for them and their family. And that's my goal is to help people become financially free, even on the modest, just on the modest, most modest level. Because if, if being wealthy is in the cards for you, it'll start the day that the building the wealth will start the day that you are in control of your life. Right. And my goal is to get you to that first step to mm -hmm. try to get you financially free, whether you need 5,000 a month coming in or 10,000 a month coming in or, or 3,000 a month. Let's just figure out how to get there. Yeah. And then you can move along or we can move up together 
but let me just get you there first. Yeah, yeah. And if I think that- wealthy and you already have all this stuff done, then at those higher, that one higher level, then I like to see if I can be your coach to see if I can up your game. You know, you pay me 25 grand once, let me see if I can up your game, your game 25 grand a month. You know, mm. and if I think I can, then, then I'll sign on. And then if you think I can, we sign on, but it's a mutual agreement. But you know, if I don't think I can, I don't, I'll, I'll wait for someone else. I want to be on a winning team. Mm -hmm. Sure. Sure. And, and excuse the pun, but I don't want to play for the Cleveland Browns. I want to pay for, you know, San Francisco when they were in their heyday. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There you go. There you go. Yeah, I, thank you for not calling out the Dallas Cowboys. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm just kidding, Haley. Uh, hey, no offense. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, but so, so, Mitch. Now I think you're, what you're saying is you're at a point where it's more about giving and sharing, right? It's more about hey, look, let's do some strategic stuff that's that's useful. Whether you're a beginner, but you got to be committed, right? When you sign up a mentor, you, you got to be pretty serious. And you got to you got to take it. You know, uh, it's it's a lot of money, but it's a lot of time commitment. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of discipline. So, but I hear you. You you you're at a point where it's 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 more about, uh, you know, helping other people up their game. So, well, uh, it, it's a little deeper than that too, though, because it's not it's not all self serving. I mean, it's, I mean, it's not all so um, benevolent. When I'm talking to these people, they're smart people, and I can learn a lot from them too. They keep me sharp. You know, I can't learn about every software right when it comes out. I can't learn about all the new technology or the new laws or the new pinholes they're finding where the water's dripping out of the bucket. I mean, when you talk to 100 students on a regular basis, you know, on the phone, or you talk to uh, 10, 15 smart guys in a year that are, all have 50 or 100 units, I mean, I'm picking up. I pick up some stuff too, you know, two heads are better than one, right? So a lot of times we might come up with concepts together, you yeah. know, that neither one of us thought about. So sure. it's a way of keeping myself sharp too. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah, I know. Um, so I know we're coming up on our hour. I, I, you know, the funny thing is we thought it was going to be 30 minutes, but we're, we're up on it almost no. an hour. No <laughs> one can hold me to 30 minutes. I like to talk too much. <laughs> no, we, and we love, we love listening to you. So, uh, uh, and I'm sure our audience is going to just eat this up. Uh, and, and so, so uh, Mitch, so, sort of on a, on a kind of the parting note, where can people find you? What's the best way to get hold of you? Uh, just, just share that with our audience. You know, 1000houses.com, 1000houses.com. You can see my podcast. You can see my blog. You can find all my books. You can, I mean, just about everything in my life is over there if it's worth looking at. So you can go there. You can find me on Facebook if you want to kind of keep up with my personal side of me. I, I write songs. I, I uh, play the drums. I have a ranch and I like to hog hunt a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to know me on a different level, go to my Facebook page. But if you want to know about the business side of me and, 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 and what I've been doing and what I'm up to, you can go to 1000houses.com and find all kinds of things, you know, there. I try to keep it very current. And there's sure. a ton of free stuff there. Just sure. click on the free stuff tab. Sure. Uh, I've been, I've been um, chastised by other gurus, like saying I give away too much. My philosophy is uh, the people that need me and understand they need me will find me. Everyone else, if you can make it on your own, I'm very happy for you. Go ahead. But mm -hmm. <laughs> there's a fine line between paying the street and paying a mentor. Sure. I tell everyone I graduated from La Calle U. La Calle means the Spanish. I mean, it means uh, the street in Spanish. And it's the most expensive university in the world. And it will take everything you have. And it'll take it forever. Uh, so it's, you're much better off sometimes instead of paying the street to pay a mentor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you're going to pay one way or the other. You're going to pay no one doubt way about or the other. It. Yeah. 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 No, I agree with that. Excellent. And Haley, wh where can people find you? Um, on Facebook, Instagram. Um, it's Haley, at Haley Howard Lush. Um, I have a www.lushpropertysolutions.com. Um, and you can reach me anywhere. You know, any Haley, of those platforms Haley's on um all almost all of the social uh, yeah. media platforms twitter youtube <laughs> everything 
And also on Facebook, we have a group uh, called Acquire and Retire. Uh, so just uh, search for Acquire and Retire in Real Estate. So uh, Haley and I run that group. Um, and then myself, it, it's really easy to find me. I'm on Facebook, Bobby Sharma, but uh, my startup is called uh, bettercapital.us. So you can go to bettercapital.us and find us there. But uh, Really uh, thrilled. Uh, this this was great. And uh, Mitch, as always, uh, thank you. I hope we can do yes. a more in-depth, uh, like a full on uh, webinar with you where we get a live audience uh, uh, from our meetup groups and from our Facebook groups. We combine mm -hmm. everybody. We'd, we'd love to you know, uh, have you on that as well at some point. So um, I'm all in. I'm all in, man. Just you have your people talk to my people. We'll get it done. All right. Hey, thank you so much for your time, Mitch. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.